Hearts, you know? And you know what, now we're into the, like, we're, we're now into the game proper, we, we've moved out of the training, so I'd love to kind of uh, hand it over to, to you guys for a little bit for, I think, aspects of our audience that may not be as familiar, because holding a, 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 a round ball in your hand is not kind of, you know, <laughs> weapon to a lot of people, and uh, it might be great to get a little bit of context of both what we're looking at and how the game is being played. So the round ball is basically the predecessor to the left hand, right hand thing you see in Bioshock of, of that in the left, right hand you have weapons and in the right, left hand you have sort of magic powers. And at that point, um, you didn't have it, you couldn't do both at once. So you have this thing called the Psy Amp, which was that sort of little Frankenstein arm with a ball in it that sticks out. Because uh, we didn't have any animation on the hands of any kind, we couldn't, we couldn't afford to do anything like that. And essentially you had a whole suite of, of effectively magic spells that you could you could use from that hand. And you, and we had three and we had sort of three macro classes that, you know, one one class specialized in using the sort of the, the psionics spells, um, one class you specialized in weapons, one class specialized in hacking. You you could you could basically go off that main class path, but it was um, but it sort of gave you a start in, in that class. It was it was a very difficult game and pretty um, you know, I think to to a, it, it it could be fairly obtuse at some times, but we were trying to make it less obtuse than the predecessor because um, you know the, that was even that's a game like I remember when I first bought Paul. I remember when I first bought um, System Shock Two. It was such an odd duck. System Shock One, sorry. It was such an odd duck that and, and that I looked at it like for a year and a half before I bought it because I kept looking at the box and being like, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> I, I couldn't figure it out. And of course, this goes on to be one of, like, if not my favorite, one of my favorite games of all time, and a game I ended up being fortunate enough to do a sequel for. I couldn't figure out what it was, like who that guy on the front was and, and, and all that. And I think that, you know, at that point, the accessibility wasn't really even a notion that we, as an industry, really had thought very much about. And there's some good things, I think, that come out of that. Um, because... I was playing the game the other day, and you know, there's a lot there. You know, like in terms yes. of depth, it's it's hard and it's complicated, but it also gives you a ton of freedom. Um, it, it, it's it's certainly a game. Uh, both System Shocks were games that really rewarded you for, uh, you know, kind of pushing through the early learning curve, uh, because there was so much to discover. You know, one of the design philosophies that we had that, that went back to the uh, Ultima Underworlds was to create games that um, you had a lot of choices. And, and, and we didn't tell you what the good choices were or bad choices, even if such things existed. So you were really just thrown into these worlds, which were typically quite hostile. Uh, System Shock 2 being a perfect example, where pretty much everything around you is trying to kill you. Um, and it, you know there's a, a survival horror element to it. Um, and you kind of had to figure out first how to survive for, for more than a few minutes. Uh, but then there were so many options. And again, since there, wasn't a, there wasn't a guiding hand. You know, we didn't have a quest arrow saying, you know, go north, young man, and uh, pick up this item. It was a pretty free form, what would be called open world now, uh, game environment. And, and all of that led to uh, a lot of emergent gameplay and a lot of discovery. But... The front end of that for a lot of players was just kind of intimidating and, and what is this thing? <laughs> and I, think, so it, I think something that is that jumps out at me, uh, having gone back and played the first game and the second game, and I actually played them out of order. Like when I first was a player, I played System Shock 2 and it wasn't until years later that I got into Shock 1. But you were talking about accessibility. I think what's interesting in a lot of ways is that Shock 2 is more accessible as far as like you have FPS controls and, and things are kind of more readable and your objectives are tracked a little bit more um, intentionally. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, can you guys uh, added a lot of systems complexity to, to Shock 2? Like the, the crazy thing about going back to Shock 1 is it doesn't have all these RPG elements. There aren't classes and you're not like getting experience points and leveling up like the, the uh, you know, economy that you buy stuff out of the vending machines wasn't even there. So was was that kind of 
I, I'd be interested to hear what, what you guys thought about that at the time, you know, Paul, when uh, the Rational was pitching, we want all these stats and, and extra systems and stuff layered on top compared to what the original game was and how you kind of uh, gave them guidance on that or how involved you were with the design of the second game back at the home office. Um, yeah, well, the uh, System Shock 2 was, was co-developed between uh, Looking Glass and Irrational. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, you know, it, I think it followed the larger arc of the design philosophy that, that again, sort of started with the Underworlds. And, and the Underworlds had more of a, a one leg in the traditional fantasy RPGs with very uh, clear stats, you know, strength, dexterity, and so forth. And we started to get away from that with System Shock 2 and Thief um, in terms of abstractions. And so I think, you know, yes, System Shock 2 has a lot of systems in it and you can develop different psi powers, but we, it, it's framed more in a way that, that feels emergent in the gameplay you're doing. It's not an in-your-face kind of stat thing. Um, it's, if I was really this hacker character in the you know in, in this near future scenario, what are the things that I would learn how to do? What skills would I learn how to develop? At least that was the the, the meta goal out of it. But but I'll let Ken talk to the talk to that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, it came the, the, the sort of the sort of heavier focus. It would probably had a more similar focus to RPG that a game like Underworld did in the sense that you know si si System Shock One didn't really have it was more of a Zelda thing where you'd acquire new tools as the game went on but less of a choice of those tools we kind of felt to push even more in the RPG direction simply because we were honestly very worried about how we um, compete uh, you, you know when you start you don't know if the story is going to be any good you don't know if the art's going to be any good you don't know if people are going to respond and, and so you, you're always stuck saying well what can we do to stack the deck in our, in our favor what's going to make our product unique what's going to make it special and remember, at this point, only one of the three of the partners had ever shipped a game before. You know, John and I had worked on Thief and a couple other things at Looking at Sweep, but we, we were complete amateur. I mean, and, you know, every developer in the room probably just cringed because the difference between shipping one game and shipping no games is, is insanely huge. And what I did not know could fill, you know, several very large volumes. And I was around guys like, you know, Tim and Doug, all and, and you know, I, 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 I knew them, I interacted with them, you know, and they had a huge amount of knowledge base that we didn't have. So I'm sure we we made, we stumbled along the way, but there's also, I think, a term, you know, which is the genius of the novice, or I think of it, the genius of the idiot who doesn't know what he's doing, which is, you know, you don't know what's not gonna work because you've never been punched in the face with failing with it. And so probably if we do it all again, we wouldn't have been as ambitious because, you know, Oh God! It, it it was a very it was like look every game I've ever worked on that's been good has been incredibly difficult to, to, to make, and this was no this is no different this is no different. Um, I, I, I'd love to jump in and talk a little bit about uh, you know as you were talking about er, earlier about that 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 sense of obtuseness and that you're not exactly making it very clear to the player are you, are, are you doing the right thing are you making a decision that's going to benefit you in the course of your play, and while that that does sound I think a little bit daunting. At the outset, with with the System Shock, with Underworld, and in other games of its ilk, like you know that that followed, maybe um, well, well, obviously Thief uh, and and and, and Deus Ex, there was that sense of discovery and invention that I, in, in my memory, I, I felt more ownership over the experience that I was playing than you know even other games now that are kind of about a sense of meaningful choice. That you know back then it was like if I can get out of this bad situation based upon just all the various ways I've built my character or, or, or the inventory I'm allowed to carry with myself. It, it, it really kind of stayed with me and my sense of kind of emotional investment in the game seemed to be so great. I, I imagine you guys didn't anticipate that at the outset, but you know, I, I would love to just hear more of your thoughts on not giving the player a ton of information, but giving them all of this opportunity to just figure out their own very personal style of how they're going to play it. Uh, well, th that was by intent. Um, the, the term we use today, I, I don't recall if we use this term back in Looking Glass, but the, the other side, we talk about a player-authored experience, which is something you can do uniquely in the media of, of games, and, you know, video games, computer games, which, you know, linear media, movies and books, you, you really can't do, do effectively. 
Um, so we really tried to empower the player to, to make their own choices, sort of discover the world, decide what was right for them. And you know, one of the hallmarks of that, when you know you're doing it right, it's if you have two players who've played through the game and they have very different stories to tell about their experience. It's like, I, I think I was playing a different game than you were. Um, and it, it's not, you know, that approach is not uh, universally the right thing to do for every game by any means. Uh, but it was the approach, uh, design sensibility that we, we were using on these games. And it is still pretty unique. You don't see, you see very few games that really embrace a, a th that are brave enough at some, at some level to embrace this. Because if you, if you give control over to the player, you're taking it away from the, you as a game designer in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and that's kind of scary. And, 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 and obviously you cannot probably account for all the different permutations of how someone can play the game. There, there's a point at which you can probably sort of test it, you know, okay, I'm going to build my character this way and play it in this manner, but you kind of got to let the little birdie fly and see if it can actually get airborne. Well, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, you do have to account. Like, that's why these games are so daunting as a, de as a developer, because you do have to account for those things. So otherwise, you're going to have some very angry, you know, gamers on your hand because the, the, the possible states the game can be in is not, you know, is, if you think about a game like The, Walk like the Walking Dead, Telltale is going to be a great game. There's only so many states, you know, probably several hundred states the game can ever really be. Where the game like System Shock 2 or Underworld, there's literally, you know, X to the Y to the Z to the M states. It could be. And you, those states all have to be tested, and there's strategies to try to develop to test those states. But at the end of the day, you ship the thing and you, you cross your fingers to some point. Um, especially back then, when we didn't have huge testing teams. I was about to say, did, did you actually just kind of like have a mathematical rubric of all the different variations and you kind of set that as a path for what probably was a nominal team of testers to just kind of, okay, play it like this, play it like this, we know, play there, it like this? There are things called test plans, which a good QA person, you know, and we had, um, I think Steve Pierce was with you guys, isn't he, Paul? Yeah, yes, he is. Um, you know, Steve could probably talk to this better, but, you know, Steve um, back then and, and Sarah Verrilli and people like that um, were you know, developing plans, and I think um, 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 Lulu Lamera on, on, on was our was was our. I think she was head of testing on this. Um, uh, she was either producer or head of testing. I can't remember. She was always there doing important things. I know because <laughs> I, I remember and how vital she was to it. But um, you know, you make plans. You proactively make plans to test certain things, like make go through the levels and make sure when you know you turn all the lights on. That you know what happens when you turn every single light and level on to see if the late level crashes and blah blah blah. But you do your best. But that's what a good QA person does. He develop plus he develops things that will push the simulation and the and the game to see it, to make it break. Uh, I'm actually surprised a bit in hindsight that we didn't get into more trouble with uh, this kind of approach of of the players finding dead ends they get stuck in. Um, I think it was partly because not not well, we did did some pretty good testing and test plans, but it was also because of the way we designed and architected the the gameplay. You know, we built it around these emergent systems uh, that that ran as little simulations um, had limits themselves. You know, we're not simulating a a real world. We're not. This isn't about reality. This isn't a literal simulation. It's a game, and we're doing heuristics and we're bounding it. So we had some degree of knowledge that, okay, really crazy stuff is probably not going to happen because the systems only simulate within a relatively narrow band. Where you end up getting all the surprises for the player is the permutation of systems. If you have five different systems that can all permeate, then you get five orders of magnitude of variety. As long as each system, though, is pretty bounded, uh, you're less likely to get into trouble with a player getting, you know, in some weird state. Yeah, I think that it's interesting. Like, there's only so much you can do in such a rich set of systems as this, because, like, you know, you, you talk about, okay, you don't want them to be able to, like, easily break the physics or crash the games by, you know, turning on every light at the same time or whatever. But within the player build system, I, I think it's impressive how much, you know, you guys were able to trust the players to say, like, okay, you need to pay attention, you need to figure out 
how these, you know, different stats work together and how, you know, what you're building towards to like be better at weapons or better at Psy or kind of a middle ground between everything is really your responsibility. Because at the same time, you know, in System Shock 2, you can totally make a bad build <laughs> that will get you killed pretty easily. <laughs> Um, and it's I was going like to say, I, that, that's my memory. <laughs> yeah, and it's, like, it's not like, it's not like you're, it's, you know, I think.